This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. Midnight Club Los Angeles After finishing Midnight Club 2 and 3 Dub Edition, I figured it wouldn't be long before I covered Midnight Club LA, the first MC game I sunk a lot of time into when it first came out. But after the incredible response to the Dub Edition video, I decided to move it up a bit in the schedule. But while a part of me was excited to return for it for the first time in years, a part of me was nervous it wouldn't hold up the same. I gushed over Midnight Club 3, and I wasn't lying when I said it's now one of my favorite arcade racing games. When something makes that big of an impression, can the sequel be as good as it seemed back in the day? We'll see. Before we get into that though, I want to give some context about how long this game lasted in the public consciousness. I worked at GameStop for 5 years from 2011 to 2016. The complete edition of Midnight Club 3 released in 2009. When I started working 2 years after the game came out, we still regularly got brand new copies until around 2014 when the next generation of consoles was in full swing. Five whole years after it came out, you could still find fresh, never before played copies for sale. Most games quickly go off the presses after the initial sales boom, and here was this arcade racing game still trucking half a decade after release. It became known to my coworkers and I as the game that wouldn't die. So now that I feel like a dinosaur for talking about a game that came out when I started high school 14 years ago, let's take a look at the unkillable game and see if it still has its pedal to the floor after all these years. In classic Midnight Club fashion, LA Story acts as little more than a vessel to give you an excuse to get behind the wheel of a car and drive until the wheels fall off. You are an outsider East Coast racing champion who is new to the Los Angeles area, where you have to build up your reputation in the new city to gain access to new races and bigger cash prizes. You choose your starter car after being introduced to the villain of the game, Book, who you can tell is the bad guy by his goal of racing for money and fame instead of the love for the ride. Your main ally on the journey is Carol, the owner of a few garages in the city, who made a living after escaping communist Russia. He is your wingman to the city, setting you up on your first few races to get you on your feet and introducing you to the main drivers you will be cutting your teeth against. Through racing, your reputation increases. As you surpass each level of rep, you earn access to new parts, new cosmetics, and of course new vehicles to purchase. What I like about this system is how it encourages you to do events that would have been optional in previous games, and there are a lot of different types of races in Midnight Club LA. Outside of the standard circuit and sprint races, there are highway races where you solely race down long stretches of the 405 and weave through traffic to reach the finish. There are red light races where you race across the city when a street light turns green. A couple of new excursions also join the fun in the form of payback and delivery missions. When people dodge car payments, you take a Buick Grand National and smash up their rides before time runs out, or else their crew will come after you. Carol also hires you to deliver vehicles to customers in a sort of pseudo time trial where you have to get to a destination as fast as possible while preventing damage to the car you're in. This type of mission allows you to preview later game vehicles and give you a taste of what kind of power you can look forward to. You can get behind the wheel of a Saline S7 early, for example. Actually driving the cars feels distinct in Midnight Club Los Angeles. In some ways it is similar to the games before, and in some ways it feels entirely different. Like before, different types of cars have their own strengths and weaknesses. Muscle cars are slippery and are easy to lose control of when you make a sharp turn. Tuners and exotics are low to the ground and are zippy and grippy enough to handle turns with ease. SUVs technically make a comeback, but in the base game there are only two. Both are Land Rovers, which feels really weak in my opinion. You can also now equip any of the special abilities to any car instead of locking them to specific classes. I used Roar on every car I used, allowing me to send a shockwave out and stun all the drivers and traffic around me. Midnight Club LA is directly influenced by the time it came out, and it's hard to ignore for better or for worse. I'm not talking about the in-game billboards and ads. Sure, you can smack talk to other racers over a sidekick at the bottom left of the screen, and Apple was still pushing the iPod pretty hard despite the iPhone having been released a year before. But I'm also talking about the cars on offer, and how the game feels when you're playing it, and what the dev team focused on when they made the game. 
While Midnight Club 3 reinvented itself between its release and the release of Midnight Club 2, MCLA becomes its own separate thing as well. In many instances, Los Angeles feels entirely separated from the games before, almost rebooting the series for the next generation of consoles. It dropped the number from the title and let the game stand alone. The PS3 and Xbox 360 era kind of marked a line in the sand when it came to create a focus for Rockstar. With GTA 4 and Red Dead Redemption and even that table tennis game, the focus on realism and detail became central to the vision. That idea seeped into Midnight Club Los Angeles. The driving engine in Midnight Club LA gives a new feeling to driving. In previous generation games, all the cars felt nimble. In this game, all the vehicles have a new heft to them that can make the game feel slow, especially in the earliest vehicles, compared to the games previous. Every car takes a second to get off the line. It's appropriate, but it also makes the game feel like a grind in the beginning. Not every car is fun to drive. However, it won't be long before you get into a skyline and things pick up. There is one element I find outright aggravating about Midnight Club Los Angeles, the police. Obviously in a street racing game you need the police element to give you the feeling of being a criminal, but they are god awful in this game. They roam the streets and have a tendency to spawn in the exact place you are going. If you manage to get into a pursuit, you can't do anything to escape besides outrun them. Their field of view feels a bit far considering if you drive out of their range and they are in searching mode, they feel like they heat seek toward you. There is no quick way out of a pursuit, so you have to constantly just bide your time until you lose them, usually by driving somewhere completely out of the way where you wanted to go in the first place. One thing that has always been a pet peeve of mine in any racing game is when cops start to chase you even if you aren't moving or driving recklessly. They will always spot you, and it's especially annoying here. The reputation you earn is hardly worth the time you spend out running them, and I just got to the point of paying the nominal fees for being pulled over and being given a ticket. It's necessary, but it could have been done so much better. In Midnight Club 2 and 3, they were basically pests that rarely gave you trouble. In Midnight Club LA, it was actively a waste of time. Luckily, you can unlock cheats by collecting yellow canisters hidden around the city, and one of the cheats allows you to get rid of the cops once and for all. Midnight Club LA's car selection is a vertical slice of what the American car scene looked like. America was at a crossroads in 2008. The housing bubble burst and took the economy down with it. Cars got smaller, hence the smaller selection of SUVs in MCLA. Many of the tanky vehicles in MC3 that were new went out of production like the entire Hummer line and the Chevrolet SSR. Still, there should have been more variety. Throw in an Escalade. Jeez. Additionally, General Motors downsized production among some of their brands including Pontiac meaning the Pontiac Solstice and MCLA was one of the last times it would appear in a game while still in production before the entire Pontiac brand died off in 2010. But as some cars and brands were on their way out, Midnight Club Los Angeles introduced us to the new age of muscle cars early before they were released in public. The Dodge Charger and the Mustang were staples among American streets when the game came out, but my favorite additions came via the just debuted concept versions of the Chevy Camaro and the Dodge Challenger. They seemed so futuristic at the time, and you could drive them in this game before anyone else got their hands on them. Now there are so many of these cars on the streets that the road is almost littered with them. But back then, I wanted a Challenger so bad. Still do, honestly. The level of detail in each car model is incredible. The interiors are fully realized, and you can view them via an interior racing camera or in the garage. It's really impressive how well the developers recreated the interiors. My grandpa had an SRT8 Dodge Charger that looked exactly like this one, and seeing the interior put me right back in the driver's seat, the Hemi screaming down the highway. I miss that car. That level of detail also spreads into the open world of Los Angeles itself. While other Midnight Club games featured multiple cities, MCLA features a single map the size of all the Midnight Club 3 maps put together according to some reviews. When the South Central expansion came out, it got even bigger. The level of detail in Los Angeles is stunning. When it came out, I remember a news publication posting about how they could drive to the actual street their HQ was located and could spot the building they worked in. Besides that niche example, there are still 60 different landmark locations inside the map, including the Hollywood Walk of Fame and different college campuses. The detail is amazing enough that you'll be tempted to just drive around and see what's there. Even cars handle differently when you drive on sand. 
Midnight Club LA encourages you to race with different types of vehicles and bikes by giving you missions that challenge you to master a different kind of car. Before facing off against Book, you have to defeat the champions of different car types, and learning how to handle all the vehicles helps you get a feel for how you can drive them all. Andrew gets mad when you beat him in a car, so he challenges you to race on motorcycles, for instance. Hey, relax, man. Winning or losing doesn't matter in a piece of junk like this. Anyone can drive one. Yeah, whatever you say. For real. You think you're something special because you can press down a pedal? You think you're hard and fearless? Get on a bike, buddy. On a bike. Okay. After defeating the champions, you go head-to-head -head in a series against Book for the title of the best racer in Los Angeles. After you earn your title as the greatest driver in the greater Los Angeles area, you have one final task before the credits roll. Carol, the only person who helped you in the beginning, has a business proposition for you. If you can raise a million dollars to invest in his chain of garages, you can become his partner and everything you could previously buy is now free for life. Why would you want to do this? Back when Midnight Club LA came out, the online component was a major draw. You could take your cars online and race against other drivers. There was also an amazing feature called Rate My Ride where you could rate and download other players' custom liveries and vinyl packages. It was great because people got really creative in the in-game customization. There were also plenty of designs I would never be able to show here on YouTube because there were so many boobs on there. In this game, the customization is so robust that it was almost overwhelming. Instead of base kits you apply and tweak later, you are pushed to take the designs layer by layer. It's not as accessible at first as it was in Midnight Club 3, but you have serious freedom to create whatever you want. In 2022, mileage may vary on how accessible online features are. On PS3, the servers are entirely gone, and you can't even access Rate My Ride. On Xbox, however, it seems that, at least at the time of this posting, servers are still up. The game has been backward compatible via Xbox One and the new series systems. I saw some footage on Reddit of the game running on the Series S and it looks really, really good. Definitely an option if you want to play. It's also not a Midnight Club review without looking at the soundtrack. Midnight Club 2 had roaring techno that pushed you forward. Midnight Club 3 had an incredible selection of hip-hop music featuring rappers I grew up listening to. Midnight Club LA has a grab bag of music from hip hop to rock to metal to techno, and since it was 2008 there is even some dubstep on here in the form of Dead Mouse. There is something here for everyone. Kid Cudi is here with his classic Day and Night and Switchin' Lanes which was used to promote the South Central expansion, Beck even has a song on here. The base game has 97 tracks, and the complete version has over 100. However, as of 2018, licensing expired for some of these songs, and 10 were removed, which sucks about games having online accessibility years after release. It doesn't really matter though, because the game supports custom soundtracks. Just rip the missing songs to your hard drive, or create an entirely new playlist, and you're good to go. But if you're like me, you listen to the soundtrack as is, meaning you'll be subjected to the all-time classic, indestructible by Disturbed. There is something completely unique about Midnight Club Los Angeles that isn't in the other games. It sometimes feels slow compared to the other games in the series, but the level of detail packed into the map and the car models makes MCLA stand alone in the series in an interesting way. While I entered the last two Midnight Club games without rose-tinted glasses, it's hard to come into this one without a little bit of nostalgia. Midnight Club Los Angeles was a game I personally dedicated a lot of time into when I was in 8th grade. My friend and I got it around the same time and we played a ton of it together, especially after we became car boys after binging the Fast and Furious movies for the first time. MCLA allowed us to indulge in our street racing fantasies of ripping through the streets, free of care of the police or red lights or the dangers of head-on collisions. Me without a car, him with a beater of a Toyota 4Runner that was tan and green with plastidipped purple rims that faded to pink. We weren't exactly real life racing car drivers, but MCLA let us feel like we were plugged into car culture in some way. I mention this because while I want it to be as unbiased as possible, sometimes it's hard to separate a game from the memories. So if you think I might be biased toward it, maybe I am. But that doesn't mean I didn't have my issues with it. Is it the best in the series? I don't know, you tell me in the comments. But it's still a great game worth playing that breathes some new life and ideas into the series before inevitably being the final game we've seen in over a decade and a half. If this is it, it's hardly a bad way to go. Thank you for watching my video, if you liked it, please leave a like. If you want to see more videos like this, please hit subscribe. I have a goal of 85 billion subscribers by the end of the week, and anything gets us closer to that. 
If you want to support my channel directly, you can go and check out my Patreon in the description below. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and get early access to my videos, as well as exclusive content. I'd like to take a minute to thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Lang, Andrew Donahoe, Okayla, Just Jessica, and 8 Jesus. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. I was thinking I'd take Canyon View Drive over to San Vicente, and then make a left and get on the 405 North from there, and then I could just get off on Mulholland.